Man of Maranatha, Detroit, Michigan, where everything depends upon a proper understanding of Genesis 3.15, where the Most High God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Her seed's heel will bruise your seed's skull. Had a moment to uh, reflect and read a couple of books over the weekend. One book I think was called The Sixth, Seventh, Eighth, or The Seventh, Eighth, Eighth and Ninth Book of Moses. It's a pretty old book, but I wish I would have looked at the back of the book before reading it. But the book was chopped up into like three sections. First section just gave you the overall view, history of the Israelites, especially through the, uh, the, the character of Moses. And then the author tried to explain how how and what Moses really was and that he was a, a magician and a sorcerer and after that the third part of the book the author began to ask a lot of questions which the normal reader would not be able to answer and thus through his questioning, it seems to have added validity to his, uh, to, to his interpretation or to his authority to properly interpret the Bible. Now, some of the questions he had were, you know, they were kind of valid or relative, like, um, you know, why aren't these books in the Bible, the book of Jasher, the book of uh, the War of the Lords, the book of Jubilees, the book of Enoch, you know, they're kind of basic. But it doesn't, for me, and I really try to keep an open mind, it doesn't uh, validate that we uh, push the whole book aside because there are books that are missing. I mean, and all I get and get an understanding, and I understand that, yes, there are some books that are missing. However, this Bible, it seems to, or, you know, just for me, it has given me a foundation of... Uh, Security, you know, it, it's a it's, it's a psychological book. It it helps the mind cope with problems. It gives you hope. Now, is that a tool of uh, what do you call it, subjection? You know, if I get you to believe that you need something, have I you know put a spell over you? And I think that's what the author's intent was to was to do is to, you know, subjugate the person, the reader to to having them say, you know, you are in need and therefore you need to buy another book. Because, you know, at the very end of the book, like I said, I wish I would have looked at the end, the very end of the book there were uh, magical spells. Now, I do understand that, you know, Moses went into Egypt and learned of all of her ways. And that Pharaoh, he too has sorcerers. But right now, I don't think that the most important thing that we should be doing is participating in sorcery and magic I mean if magic is real okay let me understand it in that it's real and yet you know I just have problems you know most of the days just trying to you know pay a bill or make sure I make a make it to a place on time you know you know or not forgetting let alone trying to stop the sun and divide the Detroit River so that I can cross and don't have to pay, you know, a toll or a fee. It, it can really get, uh, it's above my pay grade. But I do think it, it is a good book to, as you would say, and all you're getting, get an understanding, to understand that there are people out there who, who dwell in that type of, uh, and those type of rituals but there was um, 
there's another book I read. It was called uh, Sex in the Text. And there were two things, and I can't remember the second, but there were two things that kind of stood out to me in the book. The book really showed how a this particular Jewish author was showing how the Bible is a book of, how can I say, uh, relationships. And they kept bringing about the sexual undertones of, of things that are in the book and you know it's like okay I get it but the one thing that she brought out or he forgot if it was a male or female the one thing that the author brought out was this uh, a clear identity of a helpmate when God had made Eve Hava a helpmate for the Lord or for Adam now, the word, I, I'm trying to remember, it was uh, Ezer Kenendo. I think it's E Z E R K N E G D O. I think that's, if I'm, if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, I'm spelling it correctly, but it's really close on that line, and you can look it up. However, the author from a Jewish or Hebraic perspective brought out that the meaning of the helpmate was not so much to help Adam. The word also can denote being in opposition to Adam. And I found that interesting because you know, names, they, they show your vocation. And if God had created everything that's good, and I hope I'm not asking questions or, you know, bringing about an idea that is foreign that may lead one off a different path because... It was very interesting how the author has stated that Eve added to the scriptures. God never said, you don't touch the tree. God just said, you don't eat of the tree. But as the devil is in the details, it says, you know, how Eve responded to the serpent, you know, you know, the serpent said, you know, you you won't surely die. And you know, Eve is saying, I'm not supposed to touch it, I'm not supposed to eat of it, or even touch it. And if I do, then I will die. So I guess the Midrash goes on to explain, and the Midrash is our commentaries on the scriptures, how the serpent pushed Eve onto the tree. And the tree, and uh, Eve did not die after touching the tree. So then after Eve didn't touch the tree, after she touched the tree and she didn't die, she then realized that, oh, well, then maybe I can eat. And it was interesting to, to see how we add on to the scriptures. And uh, what is it? How we build fences. And in building this fence, building our doctrines, building a dogma based on a, a bad understanding of what God has said, it can, you know, put us in a different light. It can put us in, uh, I guess, making our salvation, putting our salvation in jeopardy. You know, because there are ways that seem right to a man that, in, that ends in death. So this word for help bank mate, it it shows that the Eve or the woman wasn't necessarily a helper or an assistant, but she was an assistant to bring about a demise, to bring error. She 
I don't want to say cause or influence, but this word, this Hebrew word shows that she could have her purpose was to cause Adam to err. I'm not saying sin, but to err. But after that error, she is to help him uh, get back on proper footing uh, to, to make things right. So God creates her to help him err and then also to help him get things right back again. I mean, at least that's what I got out of it, out of it. And, you know, I'm going to look into that a little bit more. But it was a it was a decent book. It went into other avenues of, you know, premarital sex, uh, homosexuality and how the Jewish council, you know, there were. There, uh, there's a body of Jewish uh, it's like a hierarchy within Judaism and they they answer these uh, questions that face the the Jewish community as of today you know as the Catholic Church they they have the same thing with their uh, magisterium they have a governing body that, you know, they, they talk about, well, is television bad? You know, because television wasn't around in the 1800s. Or, you know, is flying a helicopter, is it okay? Uh, you know, because if God gave us feet, then we shouldn't be flying. You know, all types of questions, you know, come up. And this magisterium, this body, this governing body within the religion, they answer these questions. And it was interesting to see how the train of thought was for some of these questions according to the, the Jewish mind or the Judaic mind. Other than that, had a pretty blessed weekend. Well, not weekend, sorry. I took yesterday off and just devoted to uh, reading. And let's see, anything else? So, it all gets back to Genesis 3.15. Because even if it is a book of relationship, God is showing that Adam is to personify him as Eve is to personify his wife. Let us make man in our image. Now, There is a passage where, you know, it says that God was, you know, kind of upset or it grieved God that that they made man. Now, I'm going on memory. I I don't think it says the Lord God, because see how I look at it. Genesis two, the Lord God is the father. Genesis one is God, the mother. It's like, you know, my wife, she is Mrs. Marianatha. See, I am the man of Marianatha. And if you met my wife after seeing her, you know, and you knew how I looked and you bumped into me at Costco or Sam's Club or something and you heard my voice, if you didn't know what I looked like and you go, hey, you're the man of Marianatha. And then if I was with a female, you'd probably say, is this Miss Marianatha? So the Lord God is Genesis 2. Uh, God is Genesis one and these two they're getting together and they're trying to make humanity represent personify them and being fruitful and multiplying but but the father and the mother God the fifth commandment they only had one begotten son Adam was created of the earth. But the one son that was produced by them was the only begotten son. 
Now, the body that was prepared for him was prepared through the lineage of Adam. The physical bodies of Adam, they prepared the body. They prepared the vessel that housed the spirit of our heavenly parents. When our heavenly parents got together, after Yeshua was baptized, the baptized prefigures uh, the breaking of water, the, you know, the coming through the, the vaginal womb. When Yeshua was baptized, as the story goes, when he comes up, the father is saying, this is my son who I am well pleased. And the dove representing the mate of the Lord, the spirit of God, of shows relationship, of the spirit of the Lord. The son of God, of shows relationship. So when the dove of God, the dove came upon the spirit of God, came upon uh, Yeshua as a dove. That was when the promise of the lineage of Adam, when God told the serpent that the seed of the woman's foot his foot is going to be over the seed of the serpent skull that lineage through adam which ended in joseph and in mary when those two got together and and produced the body of christ christ was an actual person and when that body was produced that body was the promise of God. He never thought it to be a, uh, a crime to be equal to God, but he wasn't God. He was the image of God. He was the word of God. He was the promise of God. So once he comes up from the baptism, the spirit comes upon him. The spirit is now tabernacling in him, within him, he now can now, he can now go and perform the works of the spirit. You know, his first part of the ministry is just talking, expressing the correct interpretations of the law. He's not like Eve. He's not adding or taking away. He's perfecting a, or presenting a accurate depiction of what the scriptures how the scriptures were meant to be understood. And he was challenging the Pharisees and Sadducees because they were adding and taking away. Now that he has shown who he is, that time came upon him where he was fully housed with the Holy Spirit. Luke 3.23, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. He was the son of Joseph. His mother was physically Mary. Miriam, they were his actual physical parents. But the spirit comes upon him. And then that is when he is Emmanuel, the promise of. Emmanuel means God is with us. God's promise is with us. He was Emmanuel. He is the promise of God, but he wasn't the promise of God at, at the baptism. I mean, that was, that was uh, prophesied or expressed in the Old Testament, but the fulfillment of his vocation happened at Golgotha. At the crucifixion. For the Lord God was teaching Christ crucified in Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15 is the death of Christ. I mean, how else is his foot going to be over a skull? It was at the crucifixion. Paul was trying to express in his, in his, in the only way that he could. He could have said more, and he probably did. But there are books that have been taken out. But let's just be focused on the books that we have. When he's on the, on the hill, known as the place of a skull, 
It wasn't Adam's skull. It wasn't Abel's skull. It was Goliath's skull because the name of the hill was called Golgath. Goliath was from Gath. Goliath was a Nephilim. Goliath, when David cut off Goliath's head, he took it to Jerusalem. A thousand years later, Yeshua is born. 33 years later, Freemasonically, Yeshua is crucified on a hill. That is how the Messiah can say, it is finished. Well, what started? Because in order for something to start, in order for something to be finished, it has to start. What started? What the Father said in Genesis 3.15. Yeshua was the fulfillment of God's word. Now, if we, you have a problem with that, let's talk about it. If you feel that I'm adding to the text, let's talk about it. If you want to call me out, that's fine. Let's talk about it. But for me, it makes perfect sense. It answers all of the questions regarding Trinity, regarding the masculine and feminine of the Father, the Fifth Commandment, and how the Israelites, how the authors of the book uh, understood God to be, our Elohim to be both masculine and feminine. They looked at them to be our parents. We are their children. Uh, Israel is was the bride of God, the Father, until Israel kept whoring around, committing adultery, uh, and he gave Israel divorce papers. See that, that book sex and the, the sex in the text really, I mean, it doesn't. And all you're getting, get an understanding. Just listen, test the spirit. If it doesn't make sense, go in your closet and ask God, ask God, the mother wisdom, Proverbs one, eight. Or ask God the Father in the name of Yeshua. Because in Exodus, God says, Behold, I will send an angel. Do whatever he says. Do not provoke him. He will forgive you of your sins, for my name is in him. If it's written in the book, I think it's something that you should consider. Especially if you're a person that feels that you are lacking. And you need something to save you. I mean, everything has a purpose. We have a purpose. But us being the creation cannot define our purpose. Only our creator can define our purpose. We can't go to our literal mother and father. We have to go to our heavenly mother and father. And we hope that, you know, we're not hot. No, we're not lukewarm. We either need to be hot or cold. I'm trying to be hot. So I'm pretty close to lukewarm, but I'm trying to get hot. Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We are all having issues of sin that prevents us from really obtaining this uh this relationship, this intimacy with God. And this is what Yeshua has done for us. He has torn down the veil through his flesh. Therefore, we have a boldness to go through the, we go before the throne of God through the veil that is his flesh, Hebrews 10, 19. When we understand the basar, yeah, that was the second part. The basar uh, and the fig tree. I'll talk about that next time. We're the fig tree. And we have to start producing fruits. You know, even though our leaves are tender, we have to start, we have to start manifesting. We have to start showing a desire that we wish to be here. But if we are a withered fig tree, 
The purpose of a fig tree is to produce figs. If we're just here and we're not producing any type of intimacy, any type of yearning to be with the Father, we will be cut down. It's in the, in the book of the Song of Songs. Songs of Solomon, Song of Songs. It talks about the fig tree. And I think that's a direct connection of the intimacy of what God has for Israel. But if Israel is not producing an intimacy towards the Father, we will be cut down. I'm the man of Maranatha, Detroit, Michigan.